All right, so uh, uh, so I'm Adam Milker. I am an FMPEG developer. I've done a lot of work on audio codecs and video codecs. I was crazy enough to write a Dalla decoder a year ago, and I wrote the first non-lib opus based uh, encoder, just, and I released it just like a week ago. So what I'm going to be talking about today is AV1. Now, for those of you who don't know what AV1 is, I've prepared a slide for that. So AV1 is supposed to be interoperable and open. So it's, going, it, it's always uh, going to be royalty free and it's going to be optimized for the internet so that, uh, so that you know, many of the people who are in this room can you know, directly benefit from that. Uh, you know, the, in, the increase in video compression, the royalty free and all the other stuff. Uh, it's going to be scalable to, to any modern device with any bandwidth, mostly. It's going to be optimized for, uh, for the hardware so that you can easily decode that with little power on, the, um, on a hardware decoder and uh, as well encode it with varying degrees of success. Um, and you know, all the other stuff which, which you see all the time in marketing. Uh, this is this, by the way, I stole from the uh, AOM website, so that, that I would never write something like that. So uh, decode it, this would mean something like that. This, these are the real bullet points. So it's going to be royalty free, it's going to be, um, it's, it is already, um, you know, in development and it's already open. Uh, and lots of companies are participating in, uh, in the development of this codec. So, uh, so all the major players like Amazon, uh, Netflix, uh, Google, YouTube, um, Mozilla, and so on. And uh, so whatever happens, the codec will see um, adoption. But, so what's important now is to get the codec to be competitive with, with other codecs that are building, being developed right now, and uh, also make it an upgrade to any codecs which are currently being used. So um, now, unfortunately, not not all um, you know uh, companies have joined. So there there is still some intellectual property out there which which we cannot use. So that means that we have to get clever and we have to go around that in some ways. And the whole process of going around means rediscovering uh, new ways of doing something which might or might not be more efficient. So um, moving on. The reference encoder is based on uh, BP9 without BP8 support, but with bug fixes. So, uh, so some of those big bug fixes were meant to go into um, BP9, but didn't. So uh, they they made it into BP10, but BP10 got turned into into AV1, and so uh, so we carry on. Um, so the way that, that the development works is companies contribute experiments and these experiments make it into Git master of, of the encoder. And uh, after being integrated, uh, the, the experiments are supposed to go through uh, intellectual property review. So there's a team of lawyers who looks at, at the description of the encoding tool and and tries to find patents which have been updated or which haven't been updated, which match the description of what the tool does. So, uh, and eventually, after uh, the bitstream has been frozen, which should happen around Q4 of this year, uh, all the experiments should be removed. Uh, this is what's, uh, in my imagination, what's meant to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So about the experiments, there are currently 50 experiments and granted some of them might uh, don't sound appealing or, down, uh, or don't sound like they contribute anything like emulated hardware or uh, the big bitstream. But the point is that most of these experiments um, uh, increase uh, encoding efficiency and well, there's just 50 of them and they're being constantly developed and updated. So there's a whole lot of development uh, going on right now. So I cannot really cover every single of the, of the 50 tools and of, the, of the experiments which are currently in the codec. And not to mention that uh, every month new experiments get added and some experiments get enabled by default. And uh, so it's, it's kind of difficult to keep track of. But I'll just go through some of the coding tools which, which have been demonstrated to give gains and have, 
you know, are, are good candidates for being, uh, you know, part of the co codec and the specifications later on. So uh, the first tool which I'll cover is directional D-ringing. Now, directional D-ringing was, uh, was something which was ported from DALA and uh, it was required in DALA because DALA used overlap and, uh, well, most of the encoding techniques in DALA uh, contributed to some degree of, of ringing in the image. So this deringing filter was developed for DALA. But it turns out that since it's right at the very end of the encoding process, uh, the, uh, at the decoding process, you can just easily paste that into any codec and it will just work. So the way it works is you first segment the, um, the image into 8 by 8 blocks and then you scan for a direction inside this 8 by 8 block. So, uh, so the, you do that by computing the, uh, the, um, um, the least squares method, I think. So the direction doesn't really matter. What matters is that it does a conditional replacement filter. So instead of blurring out any uh, artifacts and by extension any uh, uh, in, uh, detail in the image, it only acts on, uh, on very obvious uh, no, uh, ringing patterns. So in case a single pixel deviates by some amount which varies as a function of how far away you're perpendicularly from uh, from the direction vector, uh, it will replace it with, with some kind of an average. So it works really well and it gives, uh, I think, around 2 or 3% improvements. It's also easily simdiable and uh, it has currently been enabled by default in AV1. So, um, so this tool is probably going to make it into the final version of the codec. Another tool is PVQ. Now, PVQ is going to give by far the most gains, but it's by far the most difficult tool to integrate. And what you can think of PVQ is, um, you can think of it as a black box where you can insert any kind of coefficients in the frequency domain and PVQ will predict from both the current, uh, uh, the current image and whatever you give it in to predict from. So, so it can be previous pixel values, uh, uh, previous coefficient values, or it can be, for instance, uh, coefficients from Luma and you want to predict chroma. So, so the way it works is, well, I'm not really going to explain it, but you can see from the diagram uh, that if you imagine the coefficients inside a block as a vector, you can describe that vector as pointing to, to, to the surface of a sphere, of an, of an n-dimensional sphere. And if you have another vector, which is what you're wanting to predict from, you can do just a house order reflection and then you just send a, uh, a theta angle, which is, which is n minus uh, one values long. So I just wanted to spend some time on, uh, on discussing PVQ search because I think PVQ search is a, well, it's an important problem which which also needs to to be to be um, you know solved and made faster. Uh, we currently have an implementation which is carried on from Opus because Opus used a PVQ search as well. We do RDO um, on the PVQ search, so that's a bit different. But the root of the problem is 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 um, very simple. So if you have a vector. And, and you want to quantize it uh, using a PVQ search. You just normalize the vector to an L2, which is, which is the Euclidean norm, which is basically you sum up the uh, squares of each component, then you do a square root, and then you divide each component of the vector by the square root, and, uh, and well, you do that for, uh, for the output uh, uh, vector uh, quantized as well. So uh, it's a simple problem, but, but it gives great results and, uh, and I think it's the way to do vector quantization. So, so the, uh, if, we, if, if some of you wants to, to go ahead and give it a go and uh, give it a try and improving it, you will improve performance not just in DALA, not just in Opus, but in AV1 as well, so that will be useful. Uh, but. Uh, the properties of PVQ is also what makes it very interesting. Uh, using PVQ, we can vary the, uh, the code book. So we can optimize it, for instance, for areas which have low contrast. So, uh, so this is what activity masking tries to do. It, it attempts to provide better resolution at, uh, in low cost uh, co uh, contrast images. 
Um, this, is, uh, this is in contrast with, uh, with HVC, which attempts to, to aggressively remove details from the original image. And uh, if any of you has, uh, has done any encoding using HVC, they will know that SAO uh, basically is a tool which you, which you turn off if you see any bad results immediately. So activity masking is, uh, is something which is difficult to, to uh, kind of make it into uh, AV1 since it requires a different distortion function, but we're all actively working on trying to make it into, uh, into something uh, usable in AV1. So another tool which, uh, which, uh, which is also ported from DALA is uh, Chromophone Luma. And since we do PVQ entirely in the frequency domain, this means that we can also uh, inject uh, the values from, chroma, uh, from Luma coefficients and uh, more accurately describe what exactly are the details uh, in, the, in the chroma. So you might ask, well, how does it work when you have a subsampled uh, chroma? Well, you, we use TF switching to throw away any details. Uh, remember, this is all in the frequency domain, so you cannot do, uh, you know, rescaling and uh, and you know, conversion in uh, in the spatial domain since we're all in the frequency domain. So the resulting coefficients will be used in a DCT transform, and uh, that's one of the difficulties in implementing Chroma from Luma in AV1. Since AV1 has currently two different transforms, uh, AV1 has DCTs, which are the uh, the standard way of doing uh, of doing transforms, and there is an ADST which which allows you to to um, uh, to in some circumstances get better results, but there are more uh, transforms being planned to be added into AV1. So Chroma from Luma is kind of a difficult thing to implement, but the results really show that there's a big improvement in Chroma detail and in Luma detail as well, since uh, in order to better describe Chroma, you need better Luma. So that's why, TF, uh, so that's why uh, CFL is, is, is looking like a, a nice feature to, in, to implement into the final version of the codec. Now, a note is that uh, it works for 444 and it works for 420 uh, formats, but it doesn't work for 422. So uh, if you want to use 422, please don't just, just use uh, 444 or 420 or uh, or just increase the bitrate, you know, you can always just increase the bitrate like the old uh, 80 megabits uh, MPEG-2 uh, streams and pad the bitstream. But in order to pad the bitstream, there's a convenient segue here. You need to ensure that the codec, uh, that the rate control system will not overshoot. So it will not overshoot grossly since if you plan to pad, then you obviously want to pad to some, uh, to some bitrate. Uh, but you don't want to overshoot, of course. So, uh, so uh, this is what I'm currently working on. I'm trying to fix the rate control system in AV1 by just scrapping it and by inserting the rate control system from uh, DALA, which was also the rate control system from Tioro, but was ported to DALA. So, um, so the rate control system, which, which I'm working on, tries uh, to basically predict the amount of, of uh, bits that, a, that, a, um, that the current frame will use. And it does that by, by just this simple model. And uh, the scale value is, is what's modified from frame to frame. So uh, the, co the codec will first give, uh, the, use the scale value from the previous frame. So and will predict the bits uh, the current frame will take, and will then um, uh, after the frames being encoded, it will measure the real scale value. Since you know how many bits you've used, and you and you know the quantizer, and alpha is just some uh, is just uh, an exponential uh, value, which is which is different for all uh, frame uh, types, and it will correctly uh, and it will try to smoothly transition scale from one frame to the other frame using a second order Bessel filter, which will also throw away any uh, any extremes uh, in the um, uh, in the final quantization uh, values being used, and as such, it will it will give a smoother uh, you know uh, visual experiment uh, experience of of of, um, of encoding. 
So it won't do any gross overshoots that the current trade control system does. And just to share something with you, I have seen on YouTube a 200 megabits uh, sustained for five or so seconds uh, you know, uh, on, a, on a stream directly from YouTube. Granted, it was VP9, but it was 4K at 30 frames. But still, nothing warrants 200 megabits of, of, you know, of continuous usage for a few seconds. So, uh, so and, it will, and this rate control system also will support a, um, a way of, of, um, of easily providing chunks to, to kind of encode. So instead of, uh, instead of you know, uh, encoding separate temp frame chunks, uh, uh, I mean, a few seconds uh, worth of video, you know, of chunks. You can just signal a reset in the uh, in the two-pass mode of the uh, of the rate control system, and it will reset all the statistics, and you can just uh, continue on encoding as if as if you've just started encoding a new frame. And uh, yeah, yeah, all right. And um, Another feature which I'd also like to talk about uh, shortly is RNS, and uh, RNS is being developed by Google currently. And RNS will offer big improvements in the coding speed, but uh, but uh, unfortunately there are some uh, drawbacks. Uh, it needs a big enough buffer to store all the symbols in the encoder before reversing them and and uh, writing that as a bit stream because it works kind of as a stack. So uh, there are uh, some hardware manufacturers which uh, which aren't content with with having a huge buffer, but uh, but at the end it's either this or the DALA entropy coding system, both of which have the same efficiency. But RNS has the advantage of of having a uh, higher decoding speed and. Uh, and there are also some experiments which, uh, which, which I cannot really dedicate the entire um, time to talk about. But uh, there's EXT ETX, which will give more transforms, which, uh, which as I already mentioned, will kind of uh, be a bit of a problem for uh, CFL. But I'm sure we can uh, make do it uh, with, with it somehow. There's also a, uh, an adaptive coding order. So the old zigzag, which, which isn't patented anymore, uh, it turns out that the old zigzag may not uh, result in the best encoding efficiency. So if you have some kind of other patterns you can, uh, you can use and you can do RDO to figure out which pattern is the best, then yeah, we, if the experiment turns out to give improvements, we'll also make it in. And also there's uh, 64 by 64 transforms, which, which aren't quite certain that, uh, that will make it in, but, uh, but will provide big gains on any kind of, of large uniform um, uh, uh, images. So uh, with that, I'd like to end the presentation. And if there are any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's the million dollar question. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So the question was, uh, are we going to support interlaced? And uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, no comment. Say no. Say no. Say no. Just say no. I can I cannot say no. I mean, you know how it is. It's not designed by committee, but it is still designed by some people with various interests. So. Whether it will not make it or make it, I cannot say. But you know, many of us have strong opinions about it not <laughs> making it. How strong? Very strong. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Well, uh, the question was: uh, Wasn't the Bitstream going to be frozen in March of this year? And well, the bitstream was going to be frozen uh, last year, and it was going to be frozen uh, many, you know, times before that. But you know how it is. You know, you just have to keep, uh, you know, uh, extending because some features you really don't. You need some more research to to uh, to improve some features. But what's important is that we don't want to delay it too much because by that time. Uh, H.266 will, uh, will be out and, uh, and we'll have to compete with that and we want to get uh, adapted before that so that less people will adapt the less royalty free equivalents of, of uh, you know, video compression codecs. So uh, anyone else? Yeah? 
Well, so uh, we see some three you're making work. Um, and uh, my, my question would, uh, is that from, from the outside, it looks like uh, you either follow the footsteps of uh, ATP4 and the family, or uh, be like a uh, uh, foreign work. And I've seen, I've seen some work, research work on, a, on a motion prediction that is stored as a 3D scene. Yeah. Is it? Uh, well, you should look into, into uh, uh, yeah, so the question was, uh, have we looked into storing uh, motion information as, uh, as a kind of a 3D uh, type, of, type of thing, where the third dimension is time, I presume, right? Well, there, uh, there was an experiment uh, that Ziff tried to make. Uh, it was a codec. I don't remember its name, but it used wavelets in three dimensions to try to compress video. And, uh, and uh, as far as I remember, you could actually see, you know, uh, information, and, uh, images ahead of time, uh, you know, before they happen as kind of a ghostly, you know, images. But apart from that, nothing's been looked into it because it's just so, so radically different and sounds and is difficult to, to kind of do enough research to get something which is, uh, which is actually implementable and gives it gives encoding gains and doesn't require you know much hardware uh, you know to to actually implement so so i don't think that it's the way to do it and i don't think it's the way to do it for the next 50 years or something all right there's a there's a, there's a person there in the back okay Uh, so the question was, are we going to work on MP4 encapsulation, right? Yeah. Well, um, let's first get a codec which is which is presentable, and and then we'll work on MP4, uh, you know, mixing. Because uh, as it is right now, all of us are working on uh, improving the codec, but but you know. Uh, I'm not sure why you want to use uh, MP4, you know, because MP4 is, what, 20 years old now? <laughs> if it ain't broke. If it ain't broke, yeah, but... I just don't want uh, another Opus case yeah. where most people can use it because it's not in MP4. Well, regardless of whether it's in MP4, uh, it will mostly be used on the internet, and right now WebM is the de facto standard for, uh, for uh, video and audio encoding on the internet, so uh, it will first be implemented in WebM, so... Uh, well, sorry about that. Any, uh, any other? Yeah. Uh, just maybe more of an implementation thing. Yeah. Maybe some of the um, new uh, experiments pre precluded. Will there be? Is there <coughs> plans for non-tile multi threading? Uh, so the question is, are there plans for non-tile multi threading? Or the experiments might, you know, make for threading not really feasible. Um. Well. There will always be frame treading, but there will always be uh, be uh, well in the decoder. But there will always be tau trading as well. So right now there are no plans to drop tau uh, tau uh, uh, you know trading decoding. Uh, but uh, I think there were some plans to drop frame parallel uh, decoding. So there's that. You will, you have to ask uh, Thomas Didi on um, on IRC. All right. Uh, all right, one more question. Someone. All right, yeah. Right, so the question is how do you decide which, which feature, which coding tool is implementable in hardware and which one to actually implement it into the, uh, into the codec? And the answer is that uh, that during review, during initial review, uh, you'll get some feedback on whether uh, the tool you're trying to encode is feasible. And finally, uh, you know, after IP review uh, or around that time, uh, after it's it's in Gitmaster, uh, the hardware companies, which are part of the alliance, will uh, will go over uh, the coding tool and will try to see if. Uh, if it's implementable using uh, using current uh, you know hardware uh, uh, decoding production means, and uh, if they give it a go, then then you know they give it a go and it goes in. Okay, last question. All right, last question. How is the compression ratio? Uh, 
how is the compression ratio? Well, right now we're doing quite a lot better than H.264. We're doing better than H.65 uh, on basically all metrics. And uh, after uh, the encoding tools, which, uh, which I've mentioned, are implemented, we'll do slightly worse, maybe PSNR based, but PSNR is a horrible metric. So, uh, so perceptually, we will look you know, quite a lot better than anything which is currently out there. All right, uh, well, that's it. So uh, thank you for having me, I guess.